Uh, so we're going to transition our thoughts now, uh, as Miguel uh, nicely said, and we're going to look at uh, what is we as anesthesiologists, uh, based on our anesthetic plans for patients undergoing mechanical thrombectomy, uh, affect outcomes. And personal curiosity for those out in the audience, just by a show of hands, uh, for those of you that are partaking in these procedures on a regular basis, who are majorly using uh, sedation or MAC as their, as their go-to? Okay. And then what about general anesthesia? Probably 75-25 in favor of uh, uh, MAC or sedation. Green, green button. There we go. Uh, so I have no uh, financial relationships or I will not be talking about uh, any off-label or, or investigational uh, uses. Uh, so what are we hoping to accomplish over the next 15 to 20 minutes uh, with this talk? Well, we're going to first start and we're going to look at what characteristics of each anesthetic plan, sedation versus general anesthetic, uh, make it as a favorable option uh, for patients undergoing mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, the, we'll then delve into uh, the evidence and see kind of what that has to say uh, in terms of what our choices are. And then in the end, we like to bring all this together and see how it really comes together in real life practice and how, how we can utilize this information on a daily basis. So jumping right in, uh, what attributes of a sedation or MAC make it a favorable uh, option versus uh, general anesthesia? As we know, uh, time is brain, and uh, with sedation, once the patients uh, get to the interventional uh, radiology suite, uh, they can move right on in uh, to the procedure phase. Uh, you don't get that time delay uh, from arrival to needle puncture that you, you see with general anesthetics, and we'll get into a little bit more of that uh, later on here. Uh, neurologic monitoring an awake patient is obviously the best patient uh, in terms of a continuum of neurologic monitoring. Uh, you are awarded that with patients under uh, sedation as the procedure is ongoing. Uh, obviously, when you're inducing and putting these patients under general anesthesia, uh, that uh, hopefully is, is gone. Uh, hemodynamic alterations. Uh, you see less of that uh, throughout the procedure with sedation. Uh, as we know with general anesthesia on induction uh, of anesthetics, you tend to see a uh, hypotensive uh, phase. And then uh, once we uh, perform uh, laryngoscopy, you get a sympathetic surge, yeah, you get tachycardia, and you get hypertension. So you got a lot of initial uh, lability with your blood pressure swings uh, initially. Um, as we always try to do following these cases, uh, we try to liberate these patients from the ventilator. Uh, on emergence from general anesthesia, you again see those, uh, those swings in blood pressure uh, going towards the hypertensive phases. Um, obviously, you don't see all that with, uh, with patients when you're utilizing sedation. And then uh, lastly, uh, sedation requires le much less resources. Uh, there's a lot that goes into uh, providing general anesthetic for these patients from uh, anesthesiologists to uh, the machines, to the medications, to, to equipment. Uh, there's, there's a lot more uh, resource intensive uh, comparative to the sedation side of things. Uh, on the contrary, why, why general anesthetic? What, what makes that a better option, per se, uh, comparative to sedation? Well, one, uh, although there is a, a little time lag uh, between getting to the interventional suite and inducing uh, general anesthesia until they can actually get needle puncture and start the procedure, once you start, it does allow for uh, more favorable conditions, which translates into uh, a slightly reduced procedure time, uh, as we'll see. Uh, probably the biggest uh, argument favoring general anesthesia is that uh, you're not confronted with these mid-procedure surprises. And wh what do we mean by that? Uh, well, uh, as the patients are, are being administered sedation, uh, as the stroke is evolving, uh, you get varying levels of uh, neurologic depression and consciousness. Um, this can translate into patient movement. This can translate into restlessness. Uh, and, and to the extreme of things, agitation. And agitation is really uh, the biggest factor that results in uh, conversion from sedation over to general anesthesia. Uh, 
Uh, airway is also a concern uh, during these procedures uh, as well. Uh, given the, uh, the stroke uh, and the neurologic depression, uh, there's varying degrees of how uh, patients are able to manage their secretions. Uh, do they have baseline uh, sleep apnea? Is that uh, exacerbated uh, with, with the stroke? Um, aspiration is always a big concern. Uh, so all of these uh, tend to, to lead to intra-procedural interventions on our side of things uh, where you need to intervene and end up securing the airway, uh, converting over to general anesthesia. And then last, uh, everyone likes to say patient comfort. We, we like to think uh, if you're under general anesthesia, you're a lot more comfortable. Uh, than you would be under sedation. Um, but this may be more of a provider comfort uh, thing. Um, so what does the evidence say? There, there's a, a preponderance uh, of evidence out there that's been published uh, from observational trials, randomized controlled trials, uh, to meta-analyses. Given the time constraint uh, that we have at this session, we're unable to uh, go in explicit detail into everything. Uh, but there's been two nicely published uh, meta-analysis and reviews recently that we'll uh, look at that kind of brings all this data uh, together in a nice uh, summarized, concise fashion. Uh, we're going to start by looking at uh, a, a systemic review meta-analysis by Nitin Goyle and colleagues. Uh, and this uh, comprises of 16 tr trials. Uh, the majority of which, uh, as we know, are observational retrospective analyses. There are, to date, only uh, three single-center randomized controlled trials, uh, which were also uh, analyzed in this meta-analysis. Uh, and uh, what you can see here, based off of this forest plot, uh, looking at uh, functional independence uh, via modified Rankin scale of zero to two at three months, uh, when you're looking solely at the randomized controlled trials, it tends to, to favor the general anesthetic side of things. However, incorporating all those non-randomized controlled trials uh, in observational studies, it brings that uh, conglomerate as a whole back to favoring non-general anesthesia. Um, Looking at the mortality uh, as well via forest plots, uh, you can see here mortality at three months uh, is a similar uh, picture. Uh, so looking just solely at the randomized controlled trials, slightly uh, favoring uh, the general anesthetic, putting this all together, including in your non-randomized controlled trials as a whole, it tends to favor the non-general anesthetic side of things. Um, the second piece we're going to look at, this was a, a very well done piece uh, recently published last month in Anesthesia and Analgesia uh, by Bradley Hinman and Franklin Dexter. And this was a, a good review looking at 24 retrospective uh, studies in the three randomized controlled trials uh, that are out to date. And we'll start by looking at the retrospective uh, studies, and this is hard to read. Uh, but you don't need to get into too much detail. What this is really saying uh, echoes uh, what uh, Nitin Goyle's uh, analyses showed, and that's none of the observational studies to date was general anesthesia superior in neurologic outcome or mortality. Uh, the caveat with this, as we know, uh, any study uh, that is done, there are limitations. Don't want to get into too much detail uh, in critiquing this. But it needs to highlight some of the significant limitations that we find within these retrospective studies. Uh, for one, um, 10 out of the 24 uh, studies, patients that were considered uh, uh, with an endotracheal tube intubated uh, equated that as general anesthesia. And those patients that did not have an endotracheal tube were considered non-general anesthesia. And we, uh, as anesthesiologists, know that uh, a and an endotracheal tube does not equal general anesthesia, and general anesthesia does not equal an endotracheal tube. So it's a little uh, confounding in terms of uh, that definition. Uh, in addition, uh, almost half of the studies, 11 out of 24, did not report uh, what sedatives, what doses, uh, what analgesics or anesthetics were utilized uh, in, in maintaining uh, uh, the sedation and general anesthesia for these procedures. And then uh, lastly, and probably more importantly, uh, 17 out of 24 uh, analyses did not report any intraprocedural hemodynamics at all. And, and as we know and as we'll get to, uh, blood pressure management uh, is paramount in managing these patients. Uh, 
transitioning over and looking at the randomized controlled trials uh, in terms of functional outcomes is in, in mortality. Um, first look at 90-day outcomes in, in terms of functional independence defined by modified divider Rankin score of uh, two or less. And what you can see uh, here is that uh, the general anesthetics, looking at them individually, uh, tended to have better functional outcomes at, at 90 days with uh, a range of 37 to 67 percent versus the sedation group of 18 to 52 percent. Uh, pooling this data together, you get a relative risk of 0 0.74. Looking, looking back over at the mortality side of things, uh, it pretty much is the same. You're getting 8 percent to 25 percent with the general anesthetics and about 13 to 24, 25 percent in the sedation group. So looking at this specifically in terms of functional independence uh, and mortality, pretty much equal, uh, all, although there might be a slight uh, uh, tendency towards the general anesthetic group. Uh, some highlights that need to be made uh, uh, bringing out uh, from these uh, randomized controlled trials. And the biggest thing is the hemodynamics within uh, all these that were maintained. As you can see, um, between the sedation group and the general anesthetic group, uh, there was a slight uh, lower blood pressure average uh, looking at the mean values uh, comparative to the sedation group. Although they were pretty close, there was a slightly decreased uh, on, on the general anesthetics, uh, ranged around a 140. Um, this was despite very aggressive vasopressor utilization within uh, these trials, almost 100% within all three of these, uh, as you can see here. In addition, I would like to highlight uh, the doses of the general anesthetics that, that, were, that were utilized within all three trials. And you can see by these doses, uh, it's very much reduced down than, than what we would typically define as a general anesthetic maintenance dose. Uh, in other situations. So they're using very little doses, and despite using those doses, uh, they're requiring a lot of aggressive vasopressor utilization. Um, so we, we mentioned this briefly uh, earlier uh, in that uh, general anesthetic, as you would uh, expect, there are no patient uh, uh, movements or restlessness undergoing the procedures. Uh, what we're seeing is about uh, 6 to 33% uh, of uh, increased movement of patients under sedation. And what this uh, tends to translate into is a conversion rate of about, uh, on average, 10%. Uh, between the sedation uh, to, to general anesthetic groups. And the majority of these conversions uh, are from uh, agitation and, and restlessness. Uh, uh, looking at uh, workflow and reperfusion, uh, we did define that uh, the general anesthetic, there is a time lag from once they get into the interventional suite to when you get needle puncture. Uh, how extensive is that time? Uh, well, you can see here between uh, Siesta, Anstroke, and Goliath, uh, around 10 minutes uh, of delay uh, between, the, between the general anesthetics and the, and the sedation groups by the time they're able to get things rolling. Uh, now, does this translate uh, into any outcome differences? Uh, well, you can see here uh, one, one characteristic to look at is time from arterial puncture to reperfusion. And what you can see is once things get going, although there is about a 10-minute difference between an initiation of the procedure within the general anesthetic group, it does allow for a little better uh, conditions uh, for the procedure, and this is translated into uh, slightly better times for, for reperfusion. And then looking at another characteristic in terms of how adequate was the, was the perfusion following thrombolysis, mechanical thrombolysis, uh, you can see that it uh, may slightly uh, tend, to, tend to go towards the general anesthetic, but overall uh, pretty much un, undifferent. So what can we take away uh, from, from looking at this? Well, one, when general anesthetics are integrated into wor routine workflow, and you have aggressive blood pressure management, uh, specifically uh, maintaining uh, around 140 or MAPS greater than 70, then uh, what you can say, there really is no difference in outcomes between the general anesthetic groups and, and this, those sedation groups. And what really needs to be highlighted here is that 
all, all three of those randomized controlled trials uh, had integrated uh, workflows. They were very uh, accustomed to, to managing patients under general anesthesia as well as sedation. And the biggest thing is, is aggressive blood pressure control. Uh, it is paramount and, and really indifferent in terms of uh, whether you choose to do sedation or general anesthesia. Um, so is there a guide? How do, you, how do you determine which patient is uh, appropriate for general anesthesia and which one is, is not appropriate for sedation? Well, the authors uh, uh, proposed five, five easy bedside questions, uh, as you can see here. And uh, really, these, the, these can be quickly attained. And you can ask yourself, is the patient uh, neurologically intact to the point, are they able to verbally respond to, to stimuli? Are they able to respond to tactile stimuli? Are they able to follow verbal commands and understand uh, what you're communicating them, uh, with them? Uh, in addition, you can look at their uh, pulmonary status. As we said, uh, interprocedural uh, interruptions and conversions also are a result of uh, uh, airway compromise. So initial uh, appreciation uh, of the patient, are they able to lay supine without any respiratory difficulty? Uh, do you notice that they're having uh, challenges managing their secretions? Do they have a depressed cough, depressed gag? Uh, do you anticipate uh, the need for intervention for uh, aspiration needs? Uh, in addition, uh, how are they satting? Are they, are they maintaining adequate oxygenation of uh, SATA 94 or above on minimal settings? And then ultimately, if they are going to decompensate intraprocedural, what is your assessment of the ease in suboptimal conditions of managing and securing these patients' airways? And what's proposed is that if any of these, uh, the answer is no, then you probably should hedge towards uh, starting off with general anesthesia from the get-go. Uh, recall also, that uh, the majority of patients presenting with anterior uh, circulation strokes can be managed uh, safely and adequately under, under sedation. However, there is a subset based off of data, uh, roughly about 20% that uh, are not appropriate for sedation and do require general anesthesia. Um, the flip side of that uh, is those patients presenting with uh, posterior strokes or uh, basal or artery thromboses. This is a totally different uh, ball game. These patients uh, are more likely to suffer from depressed uh, consciousness, have difficulties with cranial nerve uh, dysfunctions, uh, have challenges manning secretions. And these patients uh, are really those appropriate for general anesthesia from the get-go. Uh, another point to consider that's not up here is, is also discussions with the neurointerventionalist before you're initiating uh, your anesthetic plan. They'll have an idea of, of where, the, where the exact the thrombosis is and how challenging they foresee uh, going forward with the mechanical thrombectomy. If it's something that they foresee as easy, requiring 30 minutes, uh, that uh, tends to be more favorable for, for sedation. Whereas uh, if, if the patient is a little more challenging, they foresee things being uh, a little more timely, a little more difficult, then you may want to consider general anesthesia from the get-go. Uh, so what do we make of this all? Uh, well, hopefully we, we showed that general anesthesia or sedation is acceptable. Um, Really what you need to do is an individualized approach, uh, discussions with your neurointensivist uh, as well as uh, you, the anesthesiologist. And what you need to do is what is safest for the patient and, and do things in a timely, efficient manner. As we know, uh, time is brain. Um, there are no, to, to date, there are no uh, evidence-based based guidelines, no algorithms to, to tell you which way to go. Um, it's, it's more of an individualized approach. And uh, as was highlighted earlier, uh, no matter what option you choose, sedation or general anesthesia, there needs to be strict adherence to blood pressure management uh, periprocedural uh, with uh, the goal maps uh, in systolic blood pressures, as you can see here as a starting point. And ultimately, um, where to go from here is we need multi-center randomized controlled trials to help uh, uh, illuminate uh, this idea a little bit better. Uh, thank you.